Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Rajan Ravel from Ibipsa Education Committee. I am very happy to offer the first webinar of 2021, and I'm glad that Ian Morrison has uh, agreed to offer this webinar. Ian is a professor in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, Univers uh, Engineering Department in uh, Carlton University, and very senior person at Ibipsa. He has served as a president and has also uh, helped people like me to venture into various activities of Ibipsa. I'm more happier today that because Ian has come up with a book which is which can become a textbook for many of us across the world, who is helping us to understand how really building performance simulations can be taught. And I'm glad that he has picked up this subject and going to offer an introductory uh, session about the textbook which he has written uh, through Trailer and Francis. I'm also very happy to let you know that through the efforts of Ian, Taylor and Francis is going to offer discount to all those who are attending this webinar, and I will be sharing a discount coupon or handout in the middle of the webinar, which would be available on this webinar uh, handout section. Without delaying much, I'll hand it over to Ian. Uh, we will have a question and answer session uh, after the uh, after his speech, and probably we'll take a four or five questions uh, post uh, post his lecture. Thank you very much for joining, and over to Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajan. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, and thank you on behalf of the community for organizing these these webinars. I think uh, it's a very nice forum for exchange, and it gives us something to do in these times of COVID. Um, so as Rajan is saying, um, I'm a professor at Carleton University. Um, I've been working in building performance simulation for about three decades now, and I've, I've worked in BPS in a number of different capacities. I've uh, developed models, I've developed tools, I've uh, trained users on how to use tools, supported users in industry. Um, I've taught at BPS um, in, in university settings. I use BPS extensively in my research. And all of those things have informed my thinking about how best to teach BPS to, to people. And that's resulted in, um, in this textbook. And uh, I guess I took advantage of, of our COVID lockdown over the last year, and it gave me an opportunity to finally finish, finish writing this. And uh, it was published and released last August, so about six months ago now. <clears throat> so I'm going to spend uh, today's webinar talking a little bit about my motivation for writing this book and um, the objectives of this book and I'm going to talk about how it's organized and how it could be used in either for self-study or used as a as a text in a in a course so this is a book that focuses on the fundamentals because I feel quite strongly that that that's where we're we're lacking in the BPS community. We're not we're not doing a good enough job of teaching people the fundamentals of how BPS works, understanding the inherent limitations and simplifications of tools and models, so that we can best apply them and, and have full knowledge of their applicability when we use them. Um, I wrote it as a textbook for uh, postgraduate level, um, mainly engineering courses, but it can certainly also be used as a self study guide for for people who are already in the field. Um, it's based very much on an ex experiential learning approach. And the image you're seeing on the right of the slide here is um, an article that I published in the Journal of Building Performance Simulation a couple of years ago. This came from a, a special edition that was edited by Clarice Blade Souza and Simon Tucker um, that focused on the user. And, and in that article, I describe an experiential learning approach that I've developed through my, my own teaching at, at Carleton University. Um, and the book is very much based upon that, that approach. So it's, it's studying theory, it's studying principles, but it's also having, having the reader and the student using the tools right from, from the start and the two reinforce each other. Um, I set out to write this, this book in, in a tool agnostic manner. So I didn't want it to be focused on any one or two particular BPS tools. There's a couple of tools that I use in my own teaching 
but this book in principle could be could be used for teaching using any any BPS tool. And it presumes no prior knowledge of, of BPS from the reader's perspective, but they do have to have um, a basic understanding of thermodynamics and heat transfer and some fluid flow. But I would say uh, knowledge at the undergraduate engineering level would be would be appropriate. So why a new textbook? Um, <clears throat> this is something that I've been ruminating about for, for many years. And several years ago, there was a, um, the ABIPSA Board of Directors asked Joe Clark to write a vision paper for building performance simulation. And he wrote this on, on behalf of the ABIPSA Board that really studied, uh, presented a, a vision for what BPS could and should be in the future. And one of the, the tenets in that paper was that we needed to focus more on education and training users and accrediting users. And there was a need identified out of this work for, for a, a tool agnostic resource pack for, for teaching BPS. And this is, the book is an attempt to respond to, to some of that need. Um, my thinking is that BPS has very significant potential to improve the way that we design and operate buildings, but the vast majority of that potential has not yet been realized. There's lots of, lots of reasons why, but one of them I believe is that, that BPS still suffers, suffers from a credibility gap. There's many in the construction industry who don't have a great deal of faith in these tools or the way that they're being, being used. And I think that's partly our own fault, that there's a lot of misuse of these tools. And I think if we want to realize this full potential of BPS, which is a fantastic technology, we have to do a better job at equipping users to use these tools effectively. So what I've realized after many years, and, and maybe many of you have come to this realization before me, was that it's very easy to train somebody to operate one of these tools. Um, half a day or one day training workshop, you can take any BPS tool, whether it's a, a research oriented tool or a, or a practitioner oriented tool, and you can train somebody to push all the buttons and pull all the levers to get that tool to produce results very quickly. But producing accurate results is really challenging. This is an experiment I ran in my own teaching a number of years ago um, to prove the point, I guess. And uh, the what you see on the horizontal axis are the results from 21 students. Um, in this case, they were given one of the test cases from the ASHRAE Standard 140 or the IEA Best Test. And these all 21 of these students were novice users. They had never touched BPS before. And within three weeks of starting the course, they were all able to run both ESPR and Energy Plus to run simulations on that test case. And they were all successful in producing results. What you can see here on the bars is the results that they produced. Um, on, in red is the annual space heating load and in blue, the annual space cooling load. And these dashed lines here are indicating the expected results range. And you can see a large number of students were, were well outside the mark. So it was quite easy to to train these people to start using the tools to start producing results, but achieving accurate results wasn't that easy. Now, that was a group of brand new novice users, but the literature is full of examples where experienced users also have significant disagreements in their, in their prediction results. This is a case from uh, Guillaume from, I guess, almost 25 years ago now, where they had 12 users. Some of them were newer users, some of them were very experienced users. They all used the same tool. They all had the same detailed plans and specifications on a building. And what was seen was a significant discrepancy in the predictions they had for space heating and space cooling loads. Very much like that student example I just showed you. Uh, another example from uh, California, Berkeley, Hayes and Calderup, where they took 12 professionals who were using a common BPS tool that they were familiar with. They were all given the same plans and specifications for a commercial building and asked to predict the gas and electricity consumption. And you can see the spread of the results that were produced. So again, even experienced users will make different assumptions, different approaches, focus on different aspects of the analysis and can produce drastically different results with these tools. Another example from uh, an IA annex where uh, a number of different teams using different tools were predicting the performance of 
a building whose whose um, performance was measured and they compared against again significant disagreement between some of the some of the users um, many different assumptions were taken for things like uh, thermal bridging and indoor airflow etc so why is that um, well buildings are very complex we're talking about a myriad heat and fluid flow processes that are happening concurrently we have to be able to represent the performance of all of those in order to predict the performance of the building and it's a complicated problem to analyze we have uncertain and many boundary conditions to consider we have to consider all these important processes and it's very easy for users to feel overwhelmed and one thing that many modern bps tools do is provide lots of default modeling choices for us and default input data so that in many cases we can conduct a simulation without really characterizing some of these heat and mass transfer processes. So a lot of users simply feel overwhelmed, they don't really understand what their tool is doing internally, they're not that familiar with the modeling approaches, and as a result, they can't really make informed decisions about which inputs they should be focusing on. So this is why I feel that understanding the fundamentals is critical, understanding the inherent modeling methods that are used by the tools, understanding the implications of those individual choices. What happens if I choose a default convective heat transfer coefficient uh, correlation, for example, or should I specify one? Users need to understand what are the default methods and inputs data inherent in their particular tool. Choosing the, choosing the right models and tools is very important. So you can't do all of this without understanding the theoretical basis of the tools, and that's really the the, the motivation for this book is un explaining the theoretical basis of these of these tools. So in terms of this book and how it's organized, it's really based upon the teaching approach that that I've developed through my university course at, at Carleton, where it involves four modes of learning. So it considers a number of of different topics, and I'll come to that in a second. But for each topic, it presents some theory, so it explains what are the the, the physical processes that we're trying to to represent. What are the modeling methods for representing those processes? What are the inherent assumptions? What are the inherent simplifications? And then there's exercises that are performed with a BPS tool that complement that theory. And these exercises are are structured so that they focus on aspects related to the theory that's being studied on that particular topic. And once the exercises are completed, simulation uh, predictions are made. Um, in my course, I do something they call an autopsy, and then this could be done in self-study mode as well, where we basically pull apart those simulation results, understand why did, why did the tool predict what it did? How does that, how does that explain the theory that we've previously studied? And there's, there's, um, back and forth uh, transfer of, of thinking between these modes of learning. And Reflect and Connect is really putting all of this together, taking what did I learn from the simulation exercise, how does that substantiate the theory, what did I learn from the autopsy, and then maybe go back and reperform the simulation now that I better understand uh, the concepts that, that we're focusing on. So that would be for topic one, and again I'll come to a second and what, what I mean by topics, but once we go through that, that iteration through those four modes of learning on that particular topic, we move on to the next topic and do the same kind of process and then go on to topic three and do the same kind of process. So the way I've organized this book, the topics that I've chosen for organizing this book are focused around the significant heat transfer and mass transfer processes that are occurring within buildings. And here's a schematic from the book that, that shows these schematically. This is a very uh, a gross simplification of the reality, but it's showing schematically that we have modes of heat transfer such as long wave radiation exchange happening between internal surfaces of the building. We have heat and moisture sources within the building. We have convective heat transfer happening between each internal surface of the building and the zone air. We have convective heat transfer happening from each external surface of the building and the ambient air. Long wave radiation exchange happening from each external surface to the exterior environment. Solar radiation that will be incident upon the 
exterior surface of the building. Some of it gets transmitted through the, the window and then distributed to the inside space of the building. So each one of these heat and mass transfer processes shown in this figure is, is a topic in the book and there's a dedicated chapter for each, each one of those topics. So the, the book is structured into six parts and each most parts have multiple chapters. Um, part one is really an introduction to BPS. So this is explaining for brand new users to, to BPS what the technology is, how it can be used, how it is currently used. Um, it discusses the significant heat and mass transfer processes. And then right away, there's a simulation exercise and this is called the base case. I'm gonna to return to that in a, in a few minutes. So right away, the reader of the book is reading about an introduction to BPS and then right away they're, they're touching the tool and they're starting to perform an exercise that, that is uh, structured in a very, uh, very much a structured exercise. And then moving on to part two of the building, part two of the building focuses on all of the heat and mass transfer processes happening inside the building's interior. So that would be Thinking back to the schematic I just showed you, that would be the internal long wave radiation exchange between internal surfaces, convective heat transfer happening at internal surfaces, absorption of solar energy by internal surfaces of the building. All of the processes happening within the interior of the building, and there's six, six chapters on that. And then we move to the exterior environment, and there's five chapters that look at heat transfer processes happening from the exterior surfaces of the building to the exterior environment. And then the attention turns to the building envelope, where we're looking at heat and mass that's transferred through the building envelope. And then there's a part dedicated to HVAC. And then the final part of the book includes a culminating trial. And this is, this is where we put all of the individual learnings from the individual chapters together to simulate the performance of a real building. And again, I'll come back to that in, in several minutes. So each chapter has a similar structure in the book. So again, each chapter involves these four modes of learning and focuses on an individual, for the most part, most chapters focus on an individual heat or mass transfer process. So each chapter starts off with a set of learning objectives for that chapter that are chapter specific then spend some time introducing basic theory. So this builds upon um, the reader's current knowledge of fundamentals of thermodynamics and heat transfer and fluid flow, but it doesn't presume a high level of knowledge in those topics. So it introduces the basic theories that are necessary to understand that, uh, that modeling approach. And then it talks about methods that are commonly used in the BPS field. And this is written in a tool agnostic way. So it's not focusing on one particular tool. It's talking about methods that are used in the BPS field. And for most topics, there are several methods that are discussed. It also talks about some of the strengths and weaknesses of each one of these modeling approaches. Um, <clears throat> the book does get into some mathematical descriptions. It's not meant to be a comprehensive compendium of models. This is not a, an engineering manual for a particular tool but it, it gives mathematical descriptions and it goes into the details of the mathematical descriptions when that's necessary to really illustrate the concepts. And then each chapter has one or two required readings. So these are, these are uh, articles that I've selected from journals or conference papers or sometimes reports that are all readily available. Um, and they are meant to supplement the theory pre uh, presented in the chapter. And for each required reading, there's a direction given to the reader on what to focus on. Sometimes they're told to read the entire paper. Sometimes they're told to read a, a few pages of the paper. And then there's a list of questions to guide the reader through the, the study of that material. And then each chapter has some sources for further learning. So material that, that if the student is interested in a particular topic, they can delve into much greater detail. And then there are simulation exercises in, in each chapter and then and then the chapter is closed um, with a brief summary and it provides a segue into the next, the next topic of study. So if we look, for example, at uh, chapter five, which focuses on 
long wave radiation exchange between internal surfaces of the building. Um, it starts off by giving some, introducing some basic, basic theory. It talks about the radiation processes that are happening. Uh, it then gives a little bit of a review for people. Anyone who's studied heat transfer at the undergraduate level will be familiar with these concepts, but it, it provides a building specific interpretation of some of these concepts like emission of long wave radiation, radiation properties and view factors. And then it talks about the enclosure theory approach. And then it gives a detailed description of how BPS tools that apply the enclosure theory method would calculate radiation exchange between pairs of surfaces. And that necessitates calculation of view factors. So it talks about the various methods that are available for calculating view factors. And then it also discusses methods uh, that would be more simplified methods that are commonly used by some BPS tools for representing radiation exchange between internal surfaces. And then we've got a required, a required reading, sources for further learning, and then simulation exercises. So this, this structure is repeated in each chapter. Some of the chapters um, are fairly long. Some of them are quite short. It depends on, on the material being covered. So I'll flip now to uh, chapter three to, to walk you through what some of this content looks like. So again, each chapter starts with a set of learning objectives. So this is what you hope to accomplish by the time you've completed this, this material. And this particular chapter is focusing on solar energy absorption by internal surfaces. And there are actually three chapters in the book that are focused on solar energy. This chapter relates to the energy absorbed at internal surfaces, and it has pointers to the other chapters. So for example, um, there's chapter nine, a later chapter in the book that covers methods that are used for predicting the solar irradiance on exterior surfaces of the building, including the exterior surfaces of windows. And then ch chapter 14 focuses on how we model the transmission of solar radiation through the window assembly into the inside of the building. So chapter three picks up where those other two chapters leave off. And we now look at how do we distribute that solar energy through internal surfaces of the building? How do we calculate that? So it has some background on solar radiation. Again, students who have studied radiation heat transfer in the past would find this um, a review material, but for some, this will be new materials. Um, it goes through radiation properties. It talks about uh, total radiative properties, hemispherical radiative properties, defines that for the reader. Um, it then talks about modeling methods that are commonly used by BPS tools. Um, it talks about how BPS tools will calculate the distribution of irradiance once it's passed through the window. How do we determine whether that irradiance is absorbed on this wall or absorbed on this floor? So it goes through the methods that are commonly used for, for predicting that. And then there's a required reading. As I said, each chapter has one or two required readings. This is a, a paper by Chan and Zempelikos that, that focused on um, on the implications of simplified modeling approaches for calculating how solar radiance is distributed to internal surfaces. So it gives a brief description of that article, points the reader to the article, and then the reader is told to, to read that article in its entirety and then find answers to these questions. So each required reading is guide, the reader is guided through these required readings um, and it relates that reading back to the material that's, that's covered in the book. And then in this case, there's a couple of additional readings for, for people who want to delve into this topic in a greater level of detail. And then, as I said, each, each chapter includes simulation exercises. So most of them build upon the base case that we're going to come back to in a little bit, the one that the first exercise that the students did right away in chapter one. And in this chapter, we've got um, four individual exercises. So in each case, the user is varying some inputs or exploring some more, in more greater detail modeling methods that are available in their particular tool. And they're guided through using that, that tool, producing results, and then they're asked to look at particular results and then think about how those results are explained by the theory that's covered in the, in the text. I'm going to jump now to um, 
a later chapter in the book, chapter 15, that focuses on air infiltration and natural ventilation. So again, we have learning objectives for that chapter. Um, it talks about how air, what drives air flows through the building envelopes, what are the driving forces. It talks about the main modeling methods that are used in BPS tools, it explains the general approaches. It then focuses on uh, single zone models and it provides the mathematical basis of single zone models that are available in, in many BPS tools. There's more than one single zone model. It, it gives descriptions for two of them. Um, it then goes into network airflow models. It talks about the general approach and the assumptions inherent in network airflow models. Uh, it talks about flow components and gives the, the mathematical derivation of, of examples of flow components. So then it goes on again, there's a, another required reading and this is a required reading that now focuses on a study which was done to validate, empirically validate um, airflow modeling in BPS tools. So it, again, it guides the reader through that, that material. So read the, the material and find answers to all of these questions. So again, it gives the, the students some focus when they're, when they're reading that article. And then there's additional readings provided for people who want to go into greater detail on this topic. And again, a set of simulation exercises. Okay, so the book, um, as I mentioned, it's based around an experiential teaching approach. This, this has students performing exercises right from the very start, from the very first. And in, in my teaching, I have students using the tool right from the first class on. And these exercises are really support the theory that's treated in the book. And in most of the chapters, they're isolating specific algorithms. So when we talk about solar and uh, solar radiation being absorbed at internal building surfaces, we're focusing on the exercises focus on the algorithms related to that. And the user is perturbing some of the inputs that are related directly to those algorithms. These exercises are written in tool agnostic fashion. Um, I've run the exercises myself in four separate simulation tools. Um, they're written so that they can be used with, with just about any BPS tool. So if somebody wants to use this book as a text in a course, they don't have to use the same tools that, that I'm using. And this is a very important part of the learning. This is where students get to experiment and explore the BPS tool, but they're, do, they're doing it in a guided way. So it's really given direction on how they should explore and experiment with that tool. And in my own teaching, I, I provide some video sequences that I post on the, the course website to, to guide users through these, these exercises. So let's go back to the, the Bayes case. Um, this is, I, I mentioned, this is the exercise that's performed right from the start of the, of, of the, of the book. Um, it's defined in chapter one. It's a very simple case. So here's a, a drawing of the, of the building. It's just a box, a box with one window. The geometry is, is well defined. Um, and all of the inputs that the user has to provide, or at least all of the, the data the user has to provide is, is indicated here. Now at this point in time, the reader of the book won't understand how the models are calculating solar radiation transfer through windows, but they're figuring out at this point in time what inputs are required by their, their BPS tool. So for example, Here's a set of inputs that are provided in the book for the glass layers that make up that triple glazed window assembly. And they're given information that many BPS tools will use this information. These are radiative properties at normal incidence, which some tools, some tools require. But there's also a table in the book that provides data of those radiative properties of the window assembly at various angles of incidence, which other building performance simu simulation tools will require. So the information is provided here that, so that it can model that base case in, in any tool. Um, this is the simple base case box forms the basis of all the simulation exercises that follow, except for the very final one. Um, and what I would expect is that at this point in time, the reader of the book is not preparing a perfect representation of the base case. They're doing the best they can based on their, their, their uh, point of learning of using that BPS tool. 
in my own teaching, the students take about two weeks to, to get to this point where they're able to represent that base case in a BPS tool. And everybody I've taught goes through some frustrations, they have some setbacks, uh, they lose their model inputs, things crash, they can't debug it. That's all normal. And that's, that's part of the learning process. It's an important part of the, of the learning process. But I've taught, I don't, I don't know how many students I've taught through this procedure. Um, nobody has failed to get to the point of having base case results. It's, it's definitely a doable process. So once all of those results are, are prepared, um, an important part of this learning is to do an autopsy now, to pull it apart. So when I use this, this book in my own teaching, I hold a simulation autopsy during, during a class. But this is something that could be done in self-study mode. There are some results that are posted on the, the book's companion website that, uh, that could be used as a reference point. But here's, uh, this is from a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago in the class that I'm currently teaching, where each student is identified by a letter down here. And here are the predictions of the annual space heating load. They're using two, two different tools here. Um, and the dashed lines represent the results that I predicted myself with a number of BPS tools of this base case. So, um, you know, we'd expect the student results if they have a, a representation that's uh, we expect it to be somewhere inside that range or close to that range but we can see that we have a number of outliers and that's normal that happens I mean, think back to the, the figures i showed earlier even experienced bps users have discrepancy because between them because they make different decisions about inputs they focus on different aspects uh, there's input data errors happens all the time so we use this as a collective learning process so maybe we'll open up the model we'll have uh, student e share their screen and they'll open up their their BPS tool and they'll show us the model that they've got and we'll spend some time collectively scrutinizing that. Um, sometimes we find issues right away. So many times it's input input data errors, for example. But we spend time during that that autopsy to diagnose why some people are predicting different results than others. And that's a learning exercise for everybody. And that can be done in self self-study mode as well. Here's a, um, an exercise from the chapter that focuses on convective heat transfer at internal building surfaces. And this is where the theory in the chapter has explained how BPS tools commonly calculate convective heat transfer exchange between internal surfaces in the zone air. Uh, the students learn that there are modeling choices that can be made in their tools that they're using. Uh, some tools provide uh, lots of modeling choices and the user has to make some kind of decisions. And they see here now what is the impact for each student, we're seeing um, their base case with using the tool default method, and then they impose constant convective coefficients, and they see what kind of impact that has upon simulation predictions. So each one of these chapter-specific simulation exercises focuses on particular particular algorithms that are used in the in the BPS tools. So um, the last part of the book is focused on a, a culminating trial, I call it. It's a simulation exercise that's much more involved than the other ones. This is nearing the end of the book, the end of the study through the book, where it integrates the knowledge and skills that are acquired from all the earlier chapters. So you've, at this point in time, uh, the reader has studied all of the individual heat and mass transfer processes and how they're modeled and which inputs have a significant impact, which modeling choices are appropriate in which circumstances. They have to put all of that information together at this point. And they're asked to, to use their BPS tool to predict the thermal performance of an actual building. So there's the building they focus on. This is uh, my research lab at Carleton University. It's an unoccupied uh, building. It looks like a house, but it's a lab um, that we use in our experiments related mostly to solar thermal energy and passive solar energy. Um, they're given information on the plans and specifications for that, that building. And they have to now represent that in the BPS tool. So they have to, Put all the learnings together and answer questions like which which input data should 
are, are going to have the biggest impact. Should I spend a lot of time figuring out the solar absorptivity of the cedar on the outside of that building envelope? Or should I figure out the long wave emissivity of the gypsum that makes up the interior wall assemblies? Um, they need to think about those things. Which ones of those inputs has the greatest impact? What are the modeling choices for predicting the solar reflectivity of that snow covered ground in front of the building? How do I represent that? Should I use my tool default method or should I override that tool default method? Which optional approaches are available in my BPS tool? They have to figure out issues like how do I represent the, the zoning of that building? Should I use one thermal zone for the entire building? Should I break it up into 10 different thermal zones? Uh, where are the sources of information? So they're putting all of this stuff together. Um, they're provided with, again, the, the drawings and photographs and specifications, measured weather data, weather data that's measured on site, measured internal heat gain data. And they have to put all of that together. I'll just show you briefly the, um, there's a companion website to the book that provides support for this culminating trial and other aspects. So if you click on culminating trial up here, it provides uh, some drawings. So there's floor plans of the building, detailed geometrical data on the building, uh, window schedules, um, cross sections of all the wall assemblies, an inventory of the materials used in the, in the constructions. So there's a lot of information provided by the user, but they have to decide, just like in, in a BPS practice, where do they spend their time? Where is their time most valuably spent? Should they focus on geometry? Should they focus on understanding the HVAC system and its control? So there's a lot of questions they have to, they have to deal with. So there's a series of exercises and a progression of, of exercises to, to walk them through this process. Um, I'm going to flip to that chapter of the book that specifies the culminating trial. So they're given information on the HVAC system, a schematic representation of the HVAC system, a description of its control. They're given internal heat gains and moisture sources. So this, this trial was focusing on a five-day period in, in February where we have measured data. And then in the simulation exercises, this is structured so that they focus on, uh, first off, how do they abstract the building? How do they represent the geometry? How do they zone the building? Um, how do you determine the thermophysical properties of all the materials used in the building envelope assembly? How do you treat thermal bridging? Uh, how do you treat the heat transfer through the window frames of the building? How to represent HVAC system and control? So each one of these exercises guides this, the, the reader through a series of decisions that they have to make. Um, how are they going to treat ground reflected solar radiation, convective heat transfer, uh, view factors for long wave radiation exchange, et cetera, et cetera. They analyze the weather file and then they do a mental simulation. They think, how should this building perform? What do I expect the indoor air temperatures to look like? What do I expect the loads on the HVAC system to look like? They go through that mental exercise and then perform an initial simulation. And then they compare those simulation predictions with their mental simulation. And if the two don't match up, they think, why did they not match up? Is the problem with my mental simulation model or with my input to the BPS tool? and it helps them to scrutinize and diagnose, diagnose issues. And then finally, they start predicting some of the performance parameters. So the companion website of the book provides measured data on a number of parameters. So here's uh, the students, or the reader is, is asked to predict the solar radiance on the external surface of the south wall. So this would be the, the solar radiation, the, beam component, diffuse component from the sky, plus the ground reflected component. This is measured with a pyranometer. And then they superimpose their simulation predictions on top of that. And then they're asked guided questions like, are they temporally aligned? Is the peak occurring at the same point in time? If not, think of reasons why not. Um, is the magnitude the same or similar? If not, why not? And it points students back to earlier chapters of the book where they, they can go back and and maybe refine aspects of their of their simulation. Um, here's some measured data that's provided on the indoor air temperature on the ground story of the building. So they will superimpose their simulation predictions on top of that. 
So this is a fairly involved culminating trial, but it brings together, it's important because it brings together all of the learnings of the earlier chapters of the book. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude uh, the presentation. Um, just to summarize, this, this book was published uh, about six months ago, made available about six months ago. There's a foreword written by Laurie McElroy, the uh, ABIPSA president. Uh, this is in a, an ABIPSA endorsed book. It's available in various various formats from different uh, from different sources. It's based very much upon experiential learning approach, and it's it's written in a tool agnostic fashion fashion, which I think is very important because I want the reader of this book to understand the fundamentals of BPS, not how a particular tool uses. After reading this book, they should be able to pick up any BPS tool and learn fairly quickly how to push the buttons and pull the levers to make that particular tool work. It presumes no no prior knowledge of, of BPS, um, and for instructors who might be interested in adopting this in a course or using it in a in a course, I provide a sample course outline from my own teaching, and I have other teaching materials that I'm I'm very willing to to share as well. So with that, I'd be uh, be happy to take any any questions. Thank you, and um, I hope I'm audible. There are a couple of questions, and then I'll start with uh, unmuting Alberto. Uh, Alberto Sorry, Rajan, I'm, having, I'm having difficulty hearing Rajan. Okay, uh, can you hear me well now? That's better, yes. Okay, so uh, Alberto has one question. I'm trying to unmute Alberto. Alberto, yes. Would you, would you like to okay. ask a question? Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. can hear you. Okay. Okay. Th thanks again, Ranjan. And uh, thanks, Professor Ian. It's a great presentation, a great book, excellent book. I have two questions, actually. One is, uh, how was your experience uh, teaching BPS in a long distance fashion that we are here, our, our experience right now? And how do you deal with a uh, uh, broad let's say, background experience from the students, ones that never use BPS and the ones that have more or being experts on BPS. How are you deal in a class with this broad, uh, let's say, uh, student's background? Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those questions. So um, normally I would teach my course in person. I'd be on campus and the students would be in the room and I'd, we'd, we'd have face-to-face -face contact. Um, and that's my preferred mode of teaching. This year at my university, and I think many around the world, everything is online. So I'm teaching this course right now in an online manner. Um, and it's actually working out fairly well. Um, you know, the students will will do the readings for each, each class ahead of time. I'm having the students do particular readings. I'm using polling software during our class meetings to, to uh, for me to assess which aspects of the theory they understood or didn't understand. And, and it, I guess that also ensures that they're, forces them, I suppose, to, to do the readings ahead of time. Um, and then in terms of the simulation exercises, I, I post video sequences that are screen capture videos of, of me operating the two BPS tools I use in my teaching and post those on the course website. So those are available to the students. And then when we do the autopsies, it actually is working out better online than in person because uh, I can transfer the screen sharing to a particular student in the class and they can bring up their BPS tool and show their model right away. And uh, we have a you know a good amount of discussion amongst the, the students in the class. So I find this this particular course works quite well online. I'm, I'm quite pleased with it. Not that I'm a fan of online teaching, but I'm quite pleased with the way this is working. Um, and then the second question was how to manage students at different levels of proficiency or knowledge in BPS. Um, I haven't found that to be an issue. Um, I would say most people who have BPS experience who take my course, their BPS experience is usually limited to operating a tool as opposed to understanding its fundamentals. And this course is really focused more on the fundamentals, not so much on the, the operations of the tool. Um, and in the end, when I look at this culminating trial results, I would say uh, 
I don't see a difference in the quality of the results produced by those who entered the course with some experience versus those who entered the course with no experience. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, the second question is coming from Maria. I'll unmute her. Maria, you are self-muted. Yes. You can please ask question. Okay. Hello. Thank you, Professor, for your interesting presentation. I'm Maria Ferrara. I'm actually working at Politecnico di Torino in Italy. And uh, I had some little experience in trying uh, teaching uh, uh, some fundamentals and operational some uh, tools for building performance simulation. And I was wondering how many students do you normally have in your class? Because actually, yes, in this period when we have all uh, online courses, I found it a little bit easier. But I was wondering if you have experience taking courses in presence and uh, how do you deal with the a relatively big number of students uh, in uh, i mean uh, because i found difficulties in being able to adequately give them the support they need beyond theory to overcome frustration and get the results sometimes some students uh, lose their interest uh, in the topic because just because they can't operate the tool and so i was wondering how do you deal with this kind of problems because sometimes i lose many time um much a, a lot of time uh, uh, trying to help some students uh, while the others they cannot do anything so i i need a lot of time help to to help these students so i was wondering if you have some suggestion or some experience you can share with me thanks yeah, that's a good that's a good question, Maria. Um, so to, to start with, the classes I'm teaching are fairly small. This is a, a postgraduate level course. I typically have about 20 students in the class, so it's not a large number. Um, that said, I, I think it would be quite scalable um, in the way that we I'm flipping the slide here, the way that we run the autopsy. So for, for starters, um, when the students start using the BPS tool, most of them have never touched a BPS tool before. Um, they have about two weeks to produce their first simulation results of that base case building, so that simple shoebox building. And to support their learning on how to operate the tool, I've, I've recorded, I've made a number of screen capture videos. So it's me operating uh, the two simulation tools I use in my teaching, I do a screen capture, so I open up the tool on my screen and I discuss how I'm using the tool and I show them the basics of operating the tool. Enough, those videos cover enough information that they can operate the tool to provide all the inputs necessary for that base case. And the students watch those videos uh, on their own time. Um, and in many cases, they rewatch the videos. In many cases, they have the video running while they're opening the BPS tool themselves and they and they use that as a guide and that's part of their learning process. So those screen capture videos are extremely important. When it comes time to dealing with some of the, the results that are outlined, I'm pointing back to this slide here where this was the, the course I'm teaching right now. Um, two or three weeks ago, these are the results that the students produced. And we saw that we had a number of students that were producing much higher annual space heating loads than expected, and some producing you know, somewhat lower than expected. So in that case, during the class, um, I had a student E or student L open up their, put the screen sharing on for them, and they would open up their BPS tool and show us their model. And it wasn't just me helping them diagnose what the issue was, it was the other students in the class as well. And People sometimes uh, came up with ideas and, and everybody's learning at the same time. Even though we're diagnosing, say, student L's model at that point in time, everybody is learning from that experience. Um, and the feedback I've received over the years from students is that these simulation exercises and simulation autopsies are extremely important in, in their learning process and, and uh, helping them to become more proficient at using the tools. So I think between those two of them, that, that, that uh, are, I think, very important so that uh, I'm not 
in the position where I'm having to sit down with individual students all the time, like you're you're ex expressing your frustration, Maria, at having not having enough time to help all the individual students with their individual problems. All of these students are working on the same base case representation, so they all are dealing with the same kinds of decisions, and they they're able to to help each other during these these discussion periods. Thanks. Uh, there are two short questions. Uh, one is that what are the tools to use in your class? So could you repeat that, Rajan? It, it, the, the audio was cutting in and out for me. Yeah, so the two questions. One is that which tool do you use in your class and how many hours typical course you have? Yeah, so in my in my own teaching, I've been using Energy Plus and ESPR. Um, and the course I'm teaching right now, I'm having half of the students use Energy Plus and half the students use ESPR. Um, but these cases could be represented in just about any BPS tool, really. So it's not limited to those, but those are the ones I use. And I, I prefer to use those two tools because, um, well, number one, they're freely available. That's, that's important. So the students can have easy access to them. I can install them on... Uh, a university server, which means the students can do a remote login to a university server and they don't have to go through the, the process of installing the software themselves. Um, and those two tools have a good degree of documentation of modeling methods and they also offer, offer many modeling options, different, different models for predicting individual heat and mass transfer processes. So that's a very, very, um, I find them very useful for teaching because of that. But certainly any any BPS tool could be could be exercised with these with the the exercises in this book. And what's the typical contact hours of your course? Sorry, could you repeat it again, Rajan? What are the typical contact hours of your course? How, uh, many, the contact, how many hours do you have? Yeah, the contact hours. So um, we have a 12 and a half week long semester system at Carleton University. So I have a total of 37.5 hours of contact time with the students. Um, but as I've said, I've also done a lot of screen capture videos that I've posted. So I have many, many more hours of, of material that the students can learn from directly from me. It's not just when we're in, in the class setting. Thank you. Uh, last question and then a comment. Uh, the last question is, that, do you recommend this book for uh, companies who wants to train their employees? So the question is, can it be used by companies who want to train their employees? Yes. Yeah, certainly. Um, so the book, uh, although I've written the book as a textbook, it's grown out of my own teaching. Um, it could certainly be used for self-study. And if a company had a number of employees that wanted to go through the learning process at the same time, I think that would probably be the most efficient way to do it, is to have them all studying it concurrently. Um, and that way they could perform their own simulation autopsies within the company in, in putting together results like I'm showing here and collectively diagnosing reasons for why one person is predicting a different result than another person. Um, so yes, it absolutely certainly can, but it can also be used as standalone in, in self-study mode. I think it, it's, uh, it's self-contained. Um, I have posted on the Companion website some sample results from some of the simulation exercises, so you can also use that for comparing against your own predictions. Thanks, and uh, lastly, uh, Vishal wants to say something about the webinar and a book. Really, I'll unmute Vishal. And may, uh... Yeah, thank you, Rajan, and uh, uh, hello, Dr. Yan. Uh, I would like to congratulate you for this book. I think this is very much what is required. We have seen lots of books. One, some of them, you know, are on the uh, very scientific, very research-oriented books, not practitioner-oriented, and then there are books which are uh, tool specific. So this is a wonderful book which is tool agnostic and gives the fundamentals and uh, has, still has exercises which are independent of tool and focuses on analysis. Uh, that's exactly the kind of book that is required in the teaching. Uh, I congratulate you for writing this. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Vishal. That's a very nice compliment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to let people know that this book is available in a soft version, hard copy as well as ebook. And I have posted a flyer which has a discount voucher, discount number on it. You can download and use to purchase. It, has, it is offering 20% of discount. Uh, so towards the end, I just want to thank everybody who has joined this program and webinar and encouraging us to offer more and more webinar on Ebipsa platform. And I thank Ian for offering this and also for preparing a book for many of us. Thank you, Ian, and thank you all. Thank you very much, Rajan.